Hi, I'm Terry Goodtrack. I'm the President and Chief Executive Officer of AFOE Canada. At AFOE Canada, we wanted to develop a series of podcasts that will assist our communities in better understanding some of the government operational requirements that our communities must comply with. It is my hope that these podcasts will help you in your day-to-day -day operations. Thank you. Hi, my name is Richard Paulus. I'm a Mohawk from Six Nations of the Grand River. And today I'll be doing a presentation on the summary of the federal audit policy for AFOA Canada. This presentation will cover what is a recipient audit, how recipients are selected, Aboriginal Affairs Risk Management Approach, the General Assessment, Recipient Audit's Risk Assessment, Recipient Audit Process, Areas that are working, Areas that need improvement, Tips to prepare for an audit, Added benefits in preparing for an audit, Examples of good practices which address areas needing improvement, Suggestions to prepare for an audit, and Tips for other First Nations. At the outset, it's important to note that the recipient audit is not the third-party audit referred to as the annual audit financial statement and conducted by firms like BDO, MNP, and, and Deloitte. Recipient audit is an independent assessment to provide assurance of a recipient First Nations compliance with a funding agreement and could address any or all financial and non-financial aspects of the funding agreement. Audits ensure that funding is being used for its intended purposes and that communities and organizations have the appropriate management and financial oversight mechanisms. The recipient audit is based on the 20, 2013 Aboriginal Affairs Recipient Audit Policy 300. A recipient audit is a form of compliance audit which involves reviewing and possible testing with a funding agreement and may include the following. Reviewing tasks performed by the recipient and conducting its activity, initiative, or project. Testing the validity of any report submitted. Assessing internal controls related to the funding agreement. Reviewing eligibility of expenditures incurred by the recipient. And confirming that performance objectives defined in the funding agreement are being achieved. Also assessing the recipient's compliance with the terms and conditions of the funding agreement reviewing the recipient's program management and financial control practices in relation to the funding agreement, and confirming the integrity of any data that has been reported by the recipient pursuant to the funding agreement. Recipient audit policy. Pursuant to the First Nations and Tribal Council's National Funding Agreement Model for 2014-15, Canada may audit First Nations accounts and records. Recipient audits are conducted in accordance with the generally accepted auditing standards and the policy on transfer payments. Recipient audits provide assurance as to the recipient's compliance to the terms and conditions in the contribution agreement. Aboriginal Affairs has a recipient audit plan where recipients are selected for an audit based on the risk evaluation, the value of the funding agreement, and random selection. In 2012-2013 fiscal year, Aboriginal Affairs initiated 25 recipient audits to provide assurance that the recipient's management and financial controls were adequate and that the funds were used for their intended purposes. All 25 have been completed. Compliance audit versus a recipient audit. Program compliance audits provide a program specific assessment and review about recipients level of compliance with the terms and conditions of their funding agreement. Recipient audit is an independent assurance of the recipient's level of compliance with the terms and conditions of the funding agreement. The policy on transfer payments and related directive on transfer payments emphasize the risk of use of risk-based approaches for managing transfer payment programs. Compliance activities are necessary to confirm the eligibility of expenditures and program performance. These activities will, will be carried out using a variety of risk assessment tools, review tools, and strategies as part of a broader risk management continuum. Recipient compliance reviews will include the confirmation of recipient documentation, contacting the recipient, timely assessments of recipient reports, financial and performance, periodic review of project progress, in-office desk reviews of reports and supporting documentation, pre-admission screening of eligible individuals, and on-site visits to the recipient. How recipients are selected risk assessment. 
Aboriginal Affairs has a recipient audit plan where recipients are selected for an audit based on risk evaluation, the value of the funding agreement, and random selection. Selecting re recipients for an audit first requires an assessment of risk. Risk management of transfer payments can be re reviewed on several levels within the department. Integrated risk management is a method for managing overall risk within a department. At the project or recipient level, recipients are selected for an audit after being assessed for risk by departmental managers, with assistance from program officers as required, or as recommended to departmental managers for selection by other functional experts, such as the departmental evaluation group. Aboriginal Affairs funding agreements must contain provisions that give the department a right to audit accounts and records of the recipient and of any entry to which the recipient delegates funding agreement obligations or transfers funding in order to, one, assess the re or review the recipient's compliance with the terms and conditions of the funding agreement, review the recipient's program management and financial control practices in relation to the funding agreement, three, confirm the integrity of any data which has been reported by the recipient pursuant to the funding agreement, and four, audit the management practices of the recipient in relation to the funding agreement. The recipient audit plan will be based on the risk profiles of recipients and a series of factors which the recipient audit committee will establish from time to time. Committees charged with the oversight of transfer payments management and the regions will be consulted on the selection of recipients to be audited. Aboriginal Affairs Approach to Risk Assessment, the General Assessment 2. At Aboriginal Affairs, the risk approach is supported in part by the general assessment, which was phased in in consultation with the recipients. The general assessment is completed annually by Aboriginal Affairs staff and is then shared and discussed with recipients. The general assessment is conducted on all recipients and or applicants. Through the identification of risks, the general assessment helps to, one, support the success of individual funding agreements by assessing the performance and capacity of a recipient to, ma to maintain continuity and sustainability in the delivery of programs and services. Two, to identify and prevent problems before they reach the point where default prevention and management actions are required. To inform the allocation of capacity development resources to correct problems and support continuous improvement. And finally, to enable opportunities for dialogue between the department and the recipients. Benefits of the general assessment. It helps the department to assess if a recipient may be eligible for a flexible or block contribution, funding approach, and the duration of the funding agreement. It helps to inform monitoring activities undertaken by Aboriginal Affairs staff, follow-up conversations with the recipient, etc., and program compliance activities. Also, the need for other types of assessments, for example, recipient audits, and the allocation of capacity development resources to address problems and support continuous improvement. Management risks are rated as low, medium, and high. GA risk factors. There are four factors, governance, planning, financial management, and program management. The workbook considers four major risk factors, four pillars to evaluate the community. We'll walk through one consideration of planning to illustrate how each of the considerations affect the GA score. Risk factor governance, the capacity of council board to transact, transact business. Two, the familiarity with the agreement. Three, management and framework for program management. And four, accountability to service population. The capacity to transact business refers not only to the legal capacity, but also the capacity to respond to performance variances within the organization. Elected officials need to be familiar with the contracts and agreements they have signed in the context of average affairs in Health Canada, these would be the funding agreements. Where the elected official has changed during the agreement, there needs to be a succession planning and communication. Three, there also needs to be a separation of authority between elected officials and administrative staff that are responsible for the administration. Ideally, chief and council have only one employee, the band administrator. Four, where chief and council make a point to regularly publish on their website and in newsletters, the performance of the community in terms of service delivery, policies and financial information, they are holding themselves accountable to the members of the community, funders, and the public. Risk factors planning. The three risk factors, strategic plan, 
operational plan and budget business continuity plan. The risk factor considerations relating to planning include the following. The strategic plan should reflect the goals and objectives of the community over a relatively short period of time and probably about five years and needs to be congruent with a comprehensive community plan. Two, the operational plan and budget considers the goals and objectives of the coming year. It needs to be congruent with the strategic plan and may be based on work plans of managers that have been aggregated by the band manager or CEO and approved by the chief and council. The work plans will reflect the agreed performance requirements of Aboriginal Affairs and Health Canada in accordance with funding agreements. It will also reflect work plans funded by own source revenue and other funding contracts. Three, the business continuity plan or unforeseeable contingencies plan takes into consideration the possibility of emergencies or other events that occur outside the basic operational plan. The concern of Aboriginal Affairs and Health Canada is that the community must be able to deliver funded programs even in the face of unexpected events. From a chief and council or even community perspective, if own source revenues are being used in the strategic plan and work plans, then the community needs to have confidence in the leadership that will, that will be there will be stable continuity even in emergency situations. Risk factors financial management, financial position, financial records and reporting, and financial function. The risk factor considerations related to financial management include the following. One, the general assessment workbook identifies a number of ratios that Aboriginal Affairs uses to measure the capacity of a First Nation to meet its financial obligations on the normal business terms. These formulae will be discussed in more detail in a little while as we analyze the risk factor in consideration in more detail. Two, the financial record supported audited financial statements by an independent auditor. And three, it is important that those serving a finance function within the First Nation are credentialed with a prof professional accounting designation. A professional designation such as a certified Aboriginal finance manager credentialed by AFOA Canada brings a more sophisticated level of financial management to an organization. The professional designation brings with it monitored professional development, <coughs> access to support, a code of ethics, the rules of conduct, which raise the standard of financial management and reporting within the organization. Risk factors program management, service and project delivery, service project po policies and plans, staff capacity, and reporting. The risk factor considerations related to program management include, one, the effective delivery of contracted services and projects without complaint from intended service recipients is one of the measure criteria of Aboriginal Affairs and Health Canada for the successful delivery of programs. The planning process is a core component of delivery of programs. When, when considering delivery, it is important to establish a work plan that meets the needs of the clients. Where the flexibility exists in the funding contract, program managers can often customize the delivery to meet the contractual obligations while optimizing service delivery. Three, risk of shortfalls in program delivery is mitigated when the human resource management personnel ensure that staff providing the service are qualified and where necessary can carry appropriate credentials. Four, it is not sufficient to be successful in program delivery if nobody knows what th that was done. There needs to be reporting to funders demonstrating that the program has been delivered within the parameters of the funding agreement. If this reporting is going to be truly meaningful, there will also need to be performance reporting to the chief and council and the community. The report when done will include performance variances, whether they are favorable or unfavorable, including successes and challenges with plans that will result in overcoming the challenges. Four, risk assessment. High risk assessment. So there would be limited or no qualified team members. This is, these are indicators of how, how, how you can tell. High staff turnover, unclear roles and responsibilities, limited or no internal capacity to recruit, train, or retrain appropriate personnel. This risk assessment tool looks at the recipient's capability of managing projects. If the risk assessment is high, it implicates the management team's capacity and will likely flag them for an audit. A high risk rating would likely mean a, a mandatory recipient audit. This indicates a poor management team which could put the funding 
management at high risk. Medium risk, there are some qualified team members, there's moderate, moderate staff turnover, there is some clarity regarding roles and responsibilities, and there is some internal capacity to recruit, train, and retain appropriate personnel. A medium risk rating shows management could be improved. This could mean a random selection audit. Low risk assessment. There is sufficient number of qualified team members. There is low staff turnover. There are clear roles and responsibilities. There is strong internal capacity to recruit, train, and retain appropriate personnel. A low risk rating indicates solid management and would not likely lead to an audit. And it indicates a, a strong management team. Risk management activities. This chart shows management activities which could be responded to depending on risk assessment. The choice of funding model and its inherent flexibility level for recipient activities flows from the recipient audit. For example, for recipient reporting, if there was a low risk level, there would be minimal annual reporting. A medium risk level would be minimum quarter reporting, and at a high risk level there would be minimum monthly reporting. For the recipient audit, it would be done for low risk, it would be by, be by random selection. For medium risk, it would be by random selection, and for a high risk community, First Nation, it would be mandatory. Recipient audit policy. Recipient audits are another element on the continuum of, of default prevention and management activities undertaken by the department. As indicated in all of its funding agreements, Aboriginal Affairs has the ability to conduct audits of funding recipients in order to provide assurance that a recipient is not default in the terms and conditions of the funding agreement and to provide information that can help recipient improve their management practices. Recipient audits also look at the management practices of recipients and can help to identify areas that need improvement as well as best practices that can be shared. To ensure transparency and accountability, audits and other oversight activities are designed to confirm compliance with the terms and conditions of funding agreements. Specifically, that there was no misappropriation of public funds and that funds were used for the intended purposes. Positive recipient Audit findings can result in a beneficial impact on recipient risk scores and can help to respond to management action plan requirements or other actions required as part of a default prevention or management strategy. Results of recipient audits can Im impact the default status of, of a recipient. For example, if an audit finds that the terms and conditions of funding agreements are not being respected, these findings could trigger a default action. Recipient audits continue. Aboriginal Affairs recipient audit planning process involves selecting a variable number of recipients for audit based on risk. Part of the risk assessment involves consideration of general assessment scores, default status, and other indicators. The output from the risk management model can be a risk mitigation strategy like the one shown which identifies indicators that point to risk. This strategy can help departmental managers prepare a program risk-based plan for recipient audits. For example, there may be mandatory recipient audits for recipients that have been assessed as having an overall high risk level and random selection for audits of recipients that have low to medium risk levels. Recipient audit process. The recipient audit process generally has three stages. One is the recipient audit planning, two is the execution of the audit, and three is the reporting. Recipient audit quality control should occur through all phases. Recipient audit planning. The first step of recipient audit is the recipient audit planning. First Nations are contacted and agreed to time frames. An auditor is engaged and they begin to plan the recipient audit. During the planning stage of a recipient audit, the auditor may review such things as the funding agreement, recipient claims, and any previous recipient audits. It is at this stage that the auditor may look at internal controls of the recipient relating to the funding agreement. The recipient audit would be informed of being selected for an audit. The auditor may also meet with the department to discuss areas of concern. It is at this stage that the auditor may look at internal controls of the recipient related to the funding agreement. A review of internal controls related to the agreement may necessitate a visit to the recipient or can be done by other means such as questionnaire or inquiry. Based on issues identified, the auditor determines the nature, 
the extent and timing of additional audit procedures. The audit process execution. The second step is execution. Confirming documentation from the recipient, contacting recipient for monitoring purposes, assessing recipient reports, financial and performance in a timely manner, reviewing project progress periodically, visiting the, the recipient on site. A recipient audit objective is identified and included, including a general statement of the expected output of an audit, for example, to assess the compliance with the funding agreement. The audit is conducted as per the planning memorandum with adjustments being made if further issues become apparent during the audit. The audit should include confirmation of recipient documentation, contacting the recipient, timely assessments of recipient reports, including financial and performance, periodic reviews of project progress, in-office desk reviews of reports and supporting documentation, pre-admission screening of eligible individuals, and on-site visits to the recipient. Recipient audit programs are completed with sample transactions reviewed if reasonable or high assurance is required. Recipient audit work, including evidence related to any errors or observations, is documented in the recipient audit files, for example, working papers, at this stage to support the conclusion of the audit. When possible, the auditor should obtain electronic spreadsheets of the general ledger, pay list, housing lists, post-secondary student lists, band employee lists, including key personnel such as chief and counsel, and the other records that can be easily modified to act as a working paper to, to guide the review of the detailed transactions and prepare requests for specific information and documentation to verify the eligibility of program expenditures while on site. Reporting and dissemination. The third step is reporting after the auditor prepares it and distributes a report. Any identified overpayments to the recipient may be established at debt due to the Crown and collected from the recipient. As per the agreement for recipient audit services, the auditor provides the departmental manager with the audit report. The departmental manager should review the audit report and follow up on the results of the audit in a timely fashion, based on the significance of findings in the report. Reasonable unexpended balances of advance payments made under terms of the funding agreement and held by a recipient at the end of the end fiscal year within the term of a multi-year funding agreement are not considered as repayable at that time. Areas needing improvement. Improving the governance and oversight of funding by, provided by Aboriginal Affairs. Lack of strategic plan to, to communicate the strategic objectives of the band over the next one to three years. Band manager improving the financial administration and management of the band funding provided by Aboriginal Affairs. These processes are noted from the published First Nations recipient audit reports. Other things noted were documentation of minutes for all chief and council meetings and provision of minutes for review by members of Aboriginal Affairs auditors and other stakeholders as appropriate. Regular review of financial information, quarterly at a minimum, monthly is optimal, to assess actual program and administrative expenditures compared to budgeted amounts. Clarification of the roles of the Chief and Council in the Executive Act to include the responsibility to review and approve the annual budget and to review the actual expenditures compared to the budgeted amounts on a monthly or quarterly basis. Presentation of annual budgets and audited financial statements to members on a timely basis following their completion. Prepare operational plans for the significant programs managed and administered. Based on current programs, significant programs may include education, social, facilities, operation and maintenance, housing, and band support. Documenting and providing training on financial policies, including the requirements for cash receipts, cash disbursements, accounting, and record keeping. Financial reporting. Reviewing the monthly bank reconciliations. Conducting a more thorough and documented review of monthly variance reporting and providing chief and council with financial information on a regular basis that includes budget and actual results with explanations for significant variances over and under budget. Tips to help First Nations prepare for a recipient audit. 
understanding current funding authorities, undertaking own quality assurance based on that used by Aboriginal Affairs auditors, ensuring two-way communication with the auditor, arranging a post-audit review and response to the audit, having a public relations strategy. First Nations should, should understand current funding authorities in place which they receive, for which they receive their funding. Funding models for First Nations recipients include set, flexible, fixed, block, and block. Set authorities allow for the least flexibility, while block authorities allow for the most flexibility. Flexible authority allows First Nations to keep a surplus. Fixed authority allows First Nations to keep a surplus if a plan is set out within 90 days. Block funds can be spent on community priorities and grants have no strings. Added benefits to First Nations in applying for a recipient audit. Audit recommendations may identify areas where management practices and financial controls can be improved, leading to better and effective use of funds. Audit planning lowers risk and should lower audit costs. Well, it's a way to ensure band council is aware of what's going on. The benefits of conducting a recipient audit may include that it may result in more effective use of funds for the benefit of the community. Good audit planning should lower risk assessment, which will lead to fewer recipient audits and lower third-party audit costs by MN MNP, BDO, and Deloitte, because lower costs means less substantial testing by the third-party auditor. It also, it also should lead to lower audit costs. It should bring awareness of the chief and council and the staff to the financial situation of the community. Examples of good practices. An accountable and appropriate band governance structure is in place, which reports to the chief council, leading to efficient program delivery. Ensuring approved work plans are in place and monitored by the band manager and updated annually. And ensuring your band priorities change, there is an agreed adjustment to the funding agreement with Aboriginal Affairs. A good band governance structure is in place with proper reporting to the chief and council and good communication with the band manager. Program budgets should be developed and are monitored through monthly financial reports that are presented to Chief and Council. The general ledger and year-end financial statements should be set in, in accordance with the various programs listed in the Aboriginal Affairs Contribution Agreement. Expenditures should be supported by acceptable invoices and by evidence of work performed or goods received, and pay payment issued in accordance with the specific terms and conditions of the programs. Monthly bank reconciliations are performed. There is an appropriate segregation of duties to record and approve financial transactions. Expenditures be properly accounted for on the general ledger, incurred within the time frame of the agreement, paid for, reasonable, supported by appropriate evidence, and related to the activities of the program. Documentation supporting the sample of transactions selected for examination by, as part of the audit is readily available and any additional information requested is submitted on a timely basis. Other good practices include strong policies are put in place which are reviewed and updated as necessary. Band manager worked with program managers to integrate their program plans based on available budgets and completed budget and program plans are approved by the Chief and Council. The band has a strong human resource capacity to deliver the programs and services identified in the agreement. The staff members are accredited in their own fields and receive ongoing training and to maintain their level of expertise. Recipient has a sound business practice in, in formal policies and procedures. Strong policies with sound financial management structures are important. Community program and service plans are based on available resources which are approved by council and updated on a regular basis. Making sure pro proper documentation is in place and is backed up Physically for safekeeping is another good practice. Using use of general ledgers for the compliance review and ensure line by line sync with funding agreement, checking to see if, if charged the proper programs. And uh, identifying any questions or inexplicable expenditures, getting additional information as required. Tips from other First Nations. Ensuring the scope of the recipient audit relates to the government funding only. Managing the flow of information to the auditor so that there are no surprises. Obtaining and pre-testing the audit template first. 
and getting your documentation in order. The audit should only relate to the funding provided by government. This should be made clear. The bank should know everything the auditor will see and fight ahead of time, so there will be no surprises. If there are discrepancies, explanations should be found and prepared. Pre-testing the audit template will prepare the First Nations for the actual audit. For follow-up, contact AFAO Canada. Thank you very much.